Good morning, church family. Okay, I am so excited about this sermon. Whoa. So is my mic. I'm so excited about this sermon after preaching it last service, and I think it made sense, but I'm like shaking right now, so I hope this goes well. As you know, we are in the middle of my very first sermon series titled Jesus Scapes, and this week we are talking about water. Throughout this sermon series, we're looking at four of the different landscapes that Jesus does his ministry in. Who remembers the first one that we talked about? We talked about the mountains. And the second one? Desert. Desert. And today, of course, water. And we will be concluding after camp meeting. So I get a little break. You get a little break from me. And we'll look at the garden when we are all done with this. But for today, water. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, happy Sabbath, and thank you for this wonderful church family and this time that we can spend together. I ask that you would be with us um, during a very busy time of year and also a sorrowful time for some of our church members. Please just be with each of those situations. Please bless us as we care for each other, and as we worship you on this Sabbath morning. In your name, amen. It all started with water. Genesis 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Our creator and savior's hands molded our little planet and he shaped us out of its ground. And so here we are, our birth as a human race began. There's another birth that also started with water for many of us. We all went down under the water. We let it rush over our faces and between our fingertips holding our breath in anticipation. And then strong arms may have pulled you up out of the water while angels sang and people clapped. Maybe it was river water or ocean water or maybe a lake or, like me, just baptismal tank water. Many of us have been down under that water during baptism and felt it sweep over us, signifying new birth in Christ. Last week, we briefly read about Jesus' baptism before he went into the desert. So we are not going to cover that again this week, even though that is probably one of the most famous stories having to do with Jesus and water. But this week, we will be talking about quite a few different stories having to do with water. So bear with me as we speed through this sermon this morning. What can water tell us about our Savior? And what stories about Jesus take place in locations where water is present? What did water signify to the culture that Jesus was ministering to? And what does water have to do with our relationship to Christ today? So this is what we'll be looking at in Jesus Scapes Water. If you want to turn with me to John chapter 2, we are going to delve right into one of Jesus' miracles. And I was, I called it Jesus' first miracle, first service, and it's kind of funny. Robin Caldwell reminded me technically it's Jesus' second miracle because his birth was also a miracle. So I remembered, Robin, if you were watching this. Water, uh, this is Jesus' second miracle, we'll call it. The miracle of water turning to wine. So water, obviously, is very essential to life on earth, and it is also prevalent in Jesus' ministry. And in John 2, Jesus is a young man attending a wedding in Cana of Galilee with his mother. This is after Jesus has already picked his disciples who were from the region near the wedding venue, and so they probably knew the wedding party. And Mary, Jesus' mother, is there, and she's a very conscientious woman, I would think. She's a helpful woman, and she finds out during the festivities that they have run out of wine. Now, I'm sure all of you can take a moment and 
think of your mother and remember what her face looks like when she had a job or a chore that she wanted you to do. Maybe you mothers that are out there in the audience, you've perfected that face when you want your kids to do something. So she puts on a certain tone, right? Her voice just takes on this certain tone and she looks at you a certain way, maybe tilting her head and looking down her nose a little bit when she's expecting something of you. Well, I imagine that Mary put on this certain look and tone as she came over to her son and said, they have no wine. Gave him a look. She knew who her son was. And she either wanted to show him off a little bit or just do something nice for the wedding party. But Jesus responds, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Mom, not yet. Then Mary goes, and I imagine her going over to the group of servants in the corner, and she whispers to them, just do whatever he says. And she shoes them in his direction expectantly. So Jesus turns to them and says, fill the water pots with water. Makes sense. The servants probably thought that Jesus was just joking with them because that's what you're supposed to do is fill water pots with water. So they fill them up, having no idea who they've just talked to and what is about to happen. Jesus then asks them to draw out some of the water and take it to the master of the feast. And when the master tasted it, he realized that it was new wine and he had no idea where it came from. And then the bridegroom has some, the story tells us, and he gets excited. And so Jesus' first miracle, besides his birth, happens with water. And John tells us that interestingly, after this experience, the disciples see that and they believe in him. Then Jesus and his disciples go and start traveling around the country and performing miracles. Jesus is preaching and teaching the people and healing them and teaching his disciples how to minister. And occasionally they go and hang out in their fishing boats on the Sea of Galilee. As I was looking into all of these different stories around Galilee, especially in the Jordan River and all these places where Jesus does ministry, I was struck with water's dual meaning and its presence everywhere in the Bible. Obviously, it's an element that surrounds us constantly and is essential to life. We are literally made up of like, what, 70% water, somewhere around there. Lots of water, especially here in the Northwest. <laughs> But water is just so prevalent when you start looking into the Bible. First, we've got the flood, and I'm just naming a few here. A story that completely transformed our planet, and a story in which water is the central character, and it's a force of destruction sent by God to cleanse the world. There's the crossing of the Red Sea, where God brings the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land by splitting the waters of the Red Sea and making a dry path for them to follow. Again, water has a destructive power here, and it does destroy the Egyptian army after they follow the Israelites into the water, or into where the water was. Then we've got Jonah, who was a prophet for God and ran from God's direction to preach to Nineveh by getting on a boat and heading off towards Tarshish. He, as we know, was thrown into the sea and swallowed by a whale or a big fish. Yeah, first service, some of the kids were like, swallowed by a whale. That was cute. Anyway, then we have the Jordan River and the countless stories which happen there from Elijah leaving, going up to heaven and leaving Elisha, his cloak, to the army commander Naaman and his leprosy, which was cured in the River Jordan, all the way to Jesus' baptism that we talked about last week. In the New Testament, also, Paul talks about his missionary travels across the Mediterranean Sea and his multiple times that he has to do this. And then in the story of the woman at the well, Jesus actually declares himself to be the water of life. 
So water is kind of a big deal in the Bible, isn't it? It clearly has both the power to destroy and sometimes the power to heal. And Jesus is the living water and he depicts himself that way. And even though water has this reputation for destruction, he often used it as a positive metaphor, applying it to himself since it is something that is essential to live and since he is essential for our eternal life. Somehow though, amidst all these water stories and all these moments, the disciples seem to forget Jesus' purpose in all of this. And even though they have witnessed his life and his miracles and has listened to his teachings, sometimes they seem to forget his power to transform them and even the situations around them. And the disciples become self-dependent, sometimes like we do, forgetting that Jesus was more than just a man. In Mark 4, if you'd like to turn there and skim through this chapter with me, we won't be reading the whole story, but part of it. In Mark 4, Jesus is teaching by the Sea of Galilee, and he's sharing parables. He, he goes and he gets in a boat and he sits down, and the people come and they gather around him on the beach. And he tells them a parable and starts teaching them about the kingdom of God. And about our willingness as believers to share the good news. And he talked with the disciples after that about whether you should hide your lamp under a, your bed or under a basket. Or if you should set it on a lampstand. And we know what that metaphor is referring to. Sharing our light with others. And he tells about the mustard seed which is itsy bitsy in size. But can grow into this great tree representing our faith. Having this ability to grow. And then, Mark foretells us, as evening came across the horizon, Jesus suggested to his disciples that they should take the boats to the other side of the lake. He was probably very tired. So he laid down in the stern, put a pillow down for his head, and he fell asleep. And I find this interesting because we don't often read about Jesus falling asleep. He's awake most of the time. So Jesus falls asleep. And verse 37 describes to us the state of the sea. It says, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And the disciples awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Very dramatic. Ellen White describes this moment by writing in The Desire of Ages, if the disciples had trusted in Jesus, they would have been kept in peace. Their fear in the time of danger revealed their unbelief. In their efforts to save themselves, they forgot Jesus. And it was only when, in despair of self-dependence, they turned to him that he could give them help. What's crazy about this story is what we don't hear in the chapter and what we don't hear the disciples talking about. It's something that, in fact, isn't talked about much at all in the Gospels, but we're going to look at today in their culture. It's crazy enough that these disciples are sitting in a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, which is a rather large lake, in the middle of this huge storm. That's dangerous enough. But in the superstitious culture of the area, the sea was known as a place that you did not play with. And the disciples, many of them fishermen, would have known these legends and tales and superstitions. When someone fell in, they didn't usually come back out. The depths of the waters are not something to be taken lightly or laughed at. In fact, many people in their culture actually believed that the bottom of the sea was where the demons lived. So water was not something to mess with in their culture. According to the Jewish Talmud and Jewish traditions at this time, demons were thought to basically infest water in certain ways. They were thought to infest even just a simple drink of water that you left under your bed at night. People weren't supposed to drink that water. They weren't supposed to drink water on Wednesday or on Sabbath's Eve 
or from pools and rivers at night. That's how superstitious they were about demons infesting the waters. You couldn't drink the water at these certain times or something bad might happen. And they believed that if they did accidentally drink this water or get in the river at night or something, that a demon they named Shabriri, or as we would translate it, blindness, this demon would cause them harm and torment them in some way. All that just for drinking a little bit of water. So, you can imagine the disciples in their fear in this moment on the lake. You can imagine what might be going through their minds, all these superstitions. That tends to be where we go when we're afraid. So the sea is turning into huge waves. There's dark clouds around them. And it probably seemed to the disciples like the very demons of the deep were going to capsize their ship. But finally, they realize Jesus is still in the boat with them. So they go and they wake him up and he stands up and he rebukes the wind and the sea, saying in verse 39, peace, be still. Then he turns to his disciples, it tells us, and he rebukes them, saying, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? The water's calm. Maybe Jesus is a little sad. He's just been teaching them about having faith as small as a mustard seed. And they turn around and just completely forget about everything that they, that they have been taught by him. Getting caught up in their own fears and superstitions. Yet, Jesus is still God of the wind and the waves. And so he calms the storm for them in his mercy. The disciples are amazed at this. And in the next verse, they all talk together saying, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? And knowing what we know now about their superstitious culture surrounding this sea and water, that moment probably meant a lot more to the disciples than we might see when we initially read it. To them, this moment was a transparent view of the Messiah as their savior in a very tangible way. The waters represented to them the evil forces trying to bring them down. And when Jesus calmed them, he essentially conquered those fears right before their eyes. After the waters calm down, they take the boats and they reach the shore on the other side of the lake. And they get out. And we jump into a new story with Jesus. They've entered a foreign area, and they are welcomed by a man with an unclean spirit in him. He is possessed by a demon. He lived among the tombs near the sea, and the demons were so powerful, this verse tells us, they were so powerful in him that they could not even be bound by chains. What happens with this man? Do you remember this story? The demons, they drive him over to Jesus and they recognize Jesus. They know he is the Messiah. And so they say loudly in Mark 5, verse 7, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. But Jesus commands the demons to leave the man and they beg him not to send them into the country. Instead, they ask if they can be sent to some pigs that are grazing on the, in the nearby field up on some cliffs. And Jesus agreed. I think this is a very odd little argument here, but nonetheless it happened. Jesus agreed, and so he sends the demons into the pigs. And what do the pigs do? They run off a cliff to where? Into the sea. Verse 13 says, at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Where does Jesus permit the demons to go? Back into the sea, the place where people believed demons lived. The place that Jesus just conquered and showed that he had authority and power over. It makes this such a powerful little interchange between the forces of good and evil. Jesus did crazy powerful things around water. This is what I find so interesting is that all of these stories that we start looking into 
that are around places having to do with water are very miraculous and they show his power in a very obvious way. He preached about transformation when he was around water and about growing the kingdom of God. And he showed that he had power over the forces of evil by literally transforming the elements and the, transforming the heart of the demonic man. And his disciples who are watching this are transformed as well. And what's awesome about this is that it isn't, this isn't the only time or the only situation where Jesus does something super miraculous like this and the disciples realize how powerful he is as the son of God. Our next picture here, this is Caesarea Philippi. It is a beautiful town in northern Israel. It's a place of luscious plant life, beautiful springs of water. Jesus has come out of the desert. We're not, we're not in the desert anymore. We're up in Caesarea Philippi now. It's just this beautiful place, wonderful landscape. And this is the part I'm real excited about. So if you didn't listen to the rest of the sermon, that's fine. Listen to this. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, so when I, I, when I got to travel there with uh, professors and students at Walla Walla University and traveled through this place and learned about what actually happened here and the stories here and what Jesus did, I was just completely mind blown. So I hope that you will be too. Caesarea Philippi. It was home to the sanctuary of Pan, a pagan shepherd god. And you can already see where this is going. Pagan shepherd god, direct opposition to our Messiah, our true shepherd. Anyway, a pagan cult began here a few centuries before Christ was born on earth. And ritual sacrifices took place here at the shrines and the temple that was built for this pagan god Pan. And during these rituals, they would cast the live person being sacrificed, not just animals here, live people. They would cast the person being sacrificed into the natural abyss that connected to the underground waters in the back of this large cave. And it's quite big. You can't quite tell in the picture. Maybe if you can see some of the people standing at the bottom. It's a very large abyss. So they cast people in here. And they believe that if the person disappeared under the water and they were gone, if the person just disappeared, that it was a sign that the god Pan had accepted their offering and their sacrifice. But, you remember that picture, how there's those beautiful waters coming down? Those are from a natural spring that comes up just outside the mouth of this cave. So, if blood appeared in those springs of water that were coming out of the ground, not too far from the cave, then they considered it a sign that the sacrifice was rejected. It's real icky. This place was literally called the gates to Hades and the mouth of hell. It was known in that region for those names. That's what people believed it was. And locals believed that the waters in the cave led directly into the belly of hell itself gives a real dark tint to those beautiful springs of water, huh? So Jesus made a trip to Caesarea Philippi at a very crucial point in his ministry. You can turn to Matthew chapter 16, and we will jump right into the story in this place here. Jesus visited this place with his disciples, a place that is at the heart of worship to this pagan god. It wasn't a place that was highly populated by Jewish religious folk, for obvious reasons. And it was named after the Emperor Caesar and the Herod of the time, who was called Philip. But just imagine what this would have been like for our nice little Jewish disciple friends. They probably wondered what on earth Jesus was doing bringing them to a place like this where such horrific things took place. I'm sure they wondered why Jesus would have them stand on the rock said to be near the mouth of supposed hell itself. This is a place notorious for its pagan religion and its rituals. What were they doing there? What happens next is just absolutely incredible. 
In Matthew 16, look at verse 13. And keep in mind as we read this, the context of where they are standing now. Caesarea Philippi, a place where human sacrifices are made to the pagan god Pan. Try and imagine yourself maybe standing on those rocks near the entrance of the cave as we read this. Verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And listen carefully here. Remember where they're standing. Remember where we are in the story. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Are you ready for this? This is note taking time. So number one, the name Peter, and you may already know this, but it doesn't mean some like strong, sturdy rock. It basically means like a little pebble that you could kick around across the street. That's what Peter's name means. And so Jesus calling Peter this, it's like giving him a nickname, this kind of endearing, funny little name. Second, the rock that they were standing on in Caesarea Philippi as Jesus was speaking was a place where human sacrifices took place to Pan, the God guarding what people thought were the waters to the gates to hell, of its, hell itself. So third, Jesus didn't go here to name Peter as some bishop or head of the Roman Catholic Church, as many people think that this verse means. He came to this place to declare himself as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world, as the one who would defeat the devil once and for all. He literally stood on the supposed entrance to hell and declared even on this rock, in this place where people worship the demons of hell, even here I will build my church. Amen. The gates of hell, the God pan, this cultic worship, and the devil himself shall not prevail against my church. Amen. Jesus stood in defiance to the devil proclaiming that he would build a kingdom on this earth that would spread in the hearts of men and women and take over every nation and every corner of this earth. He proclaimed that his kingdom was one that could not be shaken by the devil and his schemes, his cults, or his demons. Jesus conquered those demons in the Sea of Galilee and sent them sprawling back into the sea after casting them out of a man. And he stood by the waters at the supposed entrance to hell at the most pivotal point in his ministry, declaring that he would take back every inch of this earth that the devil stole from him and that he would restore the hearts of men to himself through the gospel of the kingdom that he was setting up, starting with his own disciples. Jesus stood on the waters to proclaim that the devil no longer had the power and could no, not win this war. His demons could not reside in the waters anymore because Jesus is the water of, li the, of, the water of life. You know what I'm trying to say? The living water that, that we have to drink of to never thirst again. Jesus transformed water as from something that was superstitious, that people thought represented so many evil things and dangerous things, from this thing, he, he transformed it to something of hope, into a promise in the Messiah and a renewed life with him. 
around water, Jesus talked about transformation and growing the kingdom of God. And on water, Jesus conquered the powers of evil and declared himself the Messiah, the son of the living God, the only water humans need. We have wrestled with the mountains standing in our way and talked about how to overcome them with Jesus through prayer and faith in him. And we have journeyed through the desert being tempted, feeling lost in our relationship with Christ and recommitting to that again. But now we have come out on the other side to the streams of living water flowing from our Savior himself. He wants to walk with you every step of the way, through every single one of those seasons of life, through those different landscapes we go through from your mountaintop experiences to your valleys low and your battles in the desert. And ultimately, he wants to transform you into a warrior for his kingdom. He wants the waters of your baptism to be more than just a time that you look back on, and, but rather something that you can say, that, that moment, that was when he transformed and changed me. He will conquer your demons and he will cast them into the sea never to be seen again. And he will build his kingdom in your heart and conquer the powers of evil that are trying to bring you down. He will calm the things that are distracting you in this world because he is the living water. Our only way to the throne room of God. He is the son of the living God, our creator and Lord, our Messiah and friend. And he wants to transform my heart and your heart today. His kingdom is here. Will you be a part of it? I have a song I want us to listen to. In my relationship with God, music is very important and speaks to my heart. And maybe it does for some of you, maybe it doesn't. But as we listen to this song, I want to invite you to come up to the front and, and bring your burdens to the Lord, kind of like we do in Garden of Prayer. As we listen to this song, you could come and, and pray or sing along if you know the words. But you can come join me at the front, and then at the end, I'll say a prayer. But let this be a time of recommitting your life to God, as we talked about last week, and accepting your mission as a part of his kingdom today. So let's listen. You can join me at the front if you like. Dear God, we come before you and cry, holy, holy, holy. We can't wait for that day when we will stand in the throne room where we can fall on our face before you and praise you, Lord. We've talked about all kinds of things in this series, but Lord, you just really placed this one on my heart, that you are so powerful, that we are so blessed. And Lord, I know that People in this room are going through the troubled waters right now. There are things happening in our lives that maybe we don't even talk about to each other. Stories of pain and hardship. And we don't know if we'll make it out of that boat alive. But God, you are with us in the boat. And you can calm the seas. And I ask that in whatever circumstance might be going on in someone's life here today, that you would just speak those words peace be still over that situation, that you would be in that person's life in a powerful way. All these stories about water, you, you did incredible things. You did extraordinary miracles. You showed yourself openly as the son of God on earth. And we ask Lord that in those times in our life that you would do the same, that your power would be present. And God, as we 
go into camp meeting for the next few weeks. I ask that these next few weeks would be a time to recommit our lives to you. Lord, may we have a mountaintop experience with you there. And may we experience something new. May we come out of the desert and may we drink from that water of life. Thank you so much for your word and for blessing us today. Be with each one in this room as we leave this place. In your name, amen. Thank you for joining me this Sabbath morning.